How do dimmers work? So something I've scratched my head on for a long time is like, it seems like there's so many different kinds of dimmers. So understanding like how light output is changed by a dimmer didn't make sense. And I think for a lot of people, you find out dimming is really weird when you run into problems. So you're out installing a new dimmer on a light and all of a sudden it's like, oh crap, it starts flickering. Like, why is it doing that? Or you'll put it in and there's no flickering, but when you try to slide the, the dimmer, nothing happens or it starts acting really jittery and crazy. So dimming has a lot to it. And the first like easiest thing to check off the list is that you gotta make sure that when you're dimming a bulb, that it is a dimmable bulb. It has to say dimmable on the package. And when you have a dimmer, it needs to match the kind of bulb. So if you have a compact fluorescent, it needs to be a dimmable compact fluorescent bulb, but you also need to have a dimmer that says that it's a CFL dimmer. If you have LED, make sure dimmable LED says it on the package for the bulb, but also that the dimmer has to say that it's an LED dimmer. But even within that, you can get weird little fluctuations, fluttering, flickering, things like that. If you have something that is designed to be a specific LED bulb that is favoring forward phase and you use a reverse phase dimmer, there's phase cutting, there's all kinds of crazy stuff with dimming. So let's just get into it. To first think about what dimming is, is just reducing power. So if you think of, you know, we have a sine wave, everything under the curve, is the you can think of it as like the area of uh, the amount of power that's being able to be transferred to the load so when we're reducing power we're we're limiting the amount of power and literally if you just change current or change voltage raise them lower them you're going to get a different power output so if we have 120 volts times 10 amps we get 1200 watts right that's 1200 watts that the load is consuming because we're pushing with a pressure of 120 volts 10 amps of current but if we lower the amount of current, we still have the same voltage, we're gonna get a lower output. So 120 times four amps instead of 10 amps gets 480 watts of power. So that's just less power being consumed. So that's kind of obvious, right? Either we raise voltage, um, raise current, lower, whatever, we're gonna get different power. And that's the essentials of dimming. Now how it's achieved is kind of polar opposite ways. And there's some older school, you know, back when things, everything was magnetic and, and we were just varying little resistors when we turned a knob. That was one way that we achieved this. But then as electronic circuits and electronic components started getting de developed, we started using electronic low voltage ELV, or we started using triax or MOSFETs, which are these little components that we put inside of ballasts. So everything electronic became a little bit trickier, but it also gave us a higher degree of control over very specific lighting. So let's talk about some of the types. If we have incandescent or halogen, we're talking about resistive. There's a little filament in here and essentially it's just a resistor. You're cramming current through a resistor. So if you can alter the amount of resistance, you're gonna affect the amount of current, right? More resistance means less current can flow through. So if you have more resistance inside of here, you're gonna dim the light because it's less power that can be transferred because there's less current flowing. Or if you crank up, the, you know, the, the knob, the rheostat, um, then you're taking less resistance or you're removing resistance so more current can flow. So it's simply just you have a resistor and you've got this little tiny thing where you can change the amount of resistance. That's those old school knob type rheostats that your granddad probably has for dimming their lights at their house. The problem though is this doesn't work with everything. So you can't do this with LED lighting or um, you know, HID lighting or like a lot of ballasted lighting. It just doesn't work this way. So when we are talking about purely resistive light, we're talking about current through a resistor and all we're gonna do is vary the resistance and to get a change in output. But we can also electronically control this as well. And we do this thing called phase cutting where we're taking, um, let's say we have a sine wave and boom, boom, boom. We only wanna cut like half of this wave and not use it. So we're cutting like the leading edge of both of these and only using the reverse part of that sine wave. We'll get into phase cutting here in a second, but I just wanted to talk to you a little bit. So once we get into it, you understand like, oh, whoa, if we're cutting portion of the phase, that means less power is getting delivered to the load. So now I understand why LED has forward phase and reverse phase. So once we get into a little bit different lighting, we go to fluorescent and CFL or compact fluorescent. 
Fluorescent is just a giant tube. You, it works off of the principle of stabilizing a certain amount of current flow through the tube, but it does it in an arc, so you're using a plasma. A lot of neon lights and things work on this. Uh, same principle, but they coat the inside of this with phosphor, and then inside there's a little bit of mercury. When we ignite the arc, it produces phosphorescence, which is essentially just um, a, an ultraviolet light that is being emitted and it's hitting a phosphor coating, allowing that phosphor coating to react or phosphoresce, and it creates light out of the tube. Compact fluorescents do the same thing. It's just basically taking this tube and like wrapping it into a knot <laughs> and making it really small. That's why it's compact fluorescent. Um, with typical fluorescents, usually you're gonna have some kind of an external ballast. It could be like a um, rapid start ballast. You could have like a two lamp, four lamp, but usually you have an electronic ballast. Now you can have old magnetic ballasts for them as well. Um, they, they work pretty much the same way. It's just that you're kind of externally controlling them. A lot of the CFLs, you'll have self-ballasted CFLs. So there's actually ballast technology integrated in with the lamp. Not always, there's like millions of different bulbs and some of them will have ballast you know, built into them and others have externally operable um, ballasts. So how they work is a little bit differently. Typically with fluorescent, we're gonna be dealing with zero to 10 volt dimming, which all that means is we can't change the current or the voltage from the power source that's powering this lamp because it needs a stable current to keep the thing glowing. So we can't just like, uh, you know, go in and, and like turn down voltage or add some resistance because it would affect the entire operation of the bulb. So we have to have a different signal, like a control signal, um, like we would do in a motor control environment, right? We just, we're not messing with the power that's being delivered to the load. We're just like signaling it to change some kind of characteristic of its behavior. And that's what zero to uh, 10 volt does. And depending on the zero, from zero to 10, you have a little bit different like adjustments that you can make in the output or the power delivery. And so that's how zero to 10 works. You also have triac, which when I mentioned a minute ago about like cutting a portion of a wave, uh, whoops, it would have been like this. <laughs> uh, we have the ability to chop out portions of a sine wave. And so we are able to vary with, uh, you know, incrementally we can vary the power delivery to that load so we can actually give it less and the light's gonna appear more dim or we can give it more and it's gonna appear really, really bright. Then we have the low voltage types of lighting. So we've got magnetic low voltage, which you're probably gonna have a large magnetic ballast. It just looks like a big transformer, big coil of wire with a, uh, an iron core in the middle of it. It's an inductor, so it, it inherently is going to try to resist changes in I, changes in current. Um, so it's usually gonna be incandescent or halogen where you're gonna see the magnetic low voltage, but it can handle inrush. It can, it's like an older kind of archaic, more stable type of a ballast. So generally, if you are chopping a waveform, it just means that you're gonna have like a sudden inrush or a sudden cutting out of power. And so these can handle that kind of an inrush and they're inductive in nature. They essentially are a giant inductor. Then we have kind of the opposite. We have an electronic low voltage. So it's still low voltage. It's still taking in some kind of an input voltage and trying to give you a lower voltage, you know, 12 volt, 24, something like that. But it's gonna act as a capacitor. So it's capacitive in nature. It cannot handle the same kind of an inrush. And typically you're talking a lot more like sensitive electronics, sensitive kind of lighting. So LED or halogen. Um, and then we have just LED. So LED lighting is very common. It's electronic in nature. It needs a driver. Whoops, the C didn't carry down. <laughs> uh, but you're gonna be taking AC, converting it into DC, and DC is what is driving the actual bulb. It can use zero to 10 volt uh, dimming, so we can ex uh, externally control the dimming levels, or we can still use a triac, which a lot of the normal like wall dimmers that you're gonna use in houses and stuff, um, they're gonna, chop part of the waveform off and that's how they achieve their dimming. So on this whole phase cutting thing, when we talk about phase cutting, let's say like we have a normal sine wave here, right? A normal sine wave is gonna have all of this, everything that's under the curve represents the power that is being transferred to the load. So we have all of this power that's being transferred. So if we wanted to cut out some of that power and dim, well, we could actually cut some of that out. So what we do is we have either forward phase or reverse phase. 
With forward phase, we're actually cutting out the front side of this wave. So now we just have a waveform that looks like this, or we're cutting the beginning of this side out and it looks like this. So forward phase means that the front side's missing or there's a delay in the, um, the, the waveform. So we're delaying it and all of a sudden there's this rapid inrush of current where um, the voltage or current is at its peak. So you can see the area under that curve is actually less. So that means that the light's actually gonna have less light output. So if you were to like, you know, be way more dramatic about this and you know, like say we're here and we're cutting out all of this, it's way less power uh, delivery because the only thing available is what's under the curve. So that's the idea is like incrementally stepping voltage up or down based off of how much of that leading part of the sine wave is cut out. Now we have reverse phase, which is just the opposite. It's basically starting out, we keep the, the shape of the waveform, but then we cut the back end of it out completely. So I should probably change colors, sorry. So we end up with something that looks like this, boom. So it's just the front part of the wave that is normal, and that back part of the wave is the thing that has the lag to it. So we're essentially slowly building up and then dropping off. And it doesn't seem like there would be a huge difference between this, but there actually is quite a big difference. If we look back to um, a second ago, let me change colors again. If we say that we start here and all of a sudden go, we have a, we have a forward phase, so we're cutting out this first portion and we're only gonna be looking at the back portion. Well, what do you notice? If this is a current graph, we have absolutely nothing happening here and all of a sudden we have this boom spike of inrush current and then it kind of drops off. And then again, we have nothing here and boom, we spike again. All of this is inrush current uh, right here. So we have to have loads that can handle a high amount of inrush current. And when we have an inductive load, inductive loads don't like, they try to resist changes in current, although they can handle them inside the ballast, the dimming technology has to be built such that it can deal with the inrush going to those bulbs. Whereas if we didn't have the inrush, we, if we had something that was um, like the green part over here, it's slowly building up and it cuts off. Well, a capacitor doesn't like changes in voltage, right? It's constantly resisting changes in voltage. So what happens is when we drop voltage all of a sudden, there's a swift change in voltage. And so we need to make sure that we design things that can handle that. That's why some of the, the, the lights that you guys put in or the, the dimmers that you're putting in need to be forward phase or reverse phase. And in some of these like LEDs, you can have forward or reverse phase. If you've ever, ever done like lighting control systems, Crestron, Lutron, like uh, their homework system or their radio raw two or three, um, some of them you can actually program in forward phase, reverse phase. So if you have some like weird fluttering issues that are happening in some of the, the light bulbs, maybe research the bulb and figure out, did they design this as a reverse phase or forward phase? Because a lot of times if you switch from one to the other, it can actually fix some of these problems. You just don't realize like, oh, this is a really, really advanced, great bulb. And you know, this dimmer that I put in here is like a really advanced dimmer. So I actually have the control over this to try to help it. But if these aren't perfectly matched, right? If you have something that's designed to be reverse phase on a forward phase setup from a forward phase device that's, that's dimming and chopping off the forward phase, but the light's meant to be on reverse phase, you're probably gonna have these little fluttery, weird issues. So um, the, the way that this chopping happens is typically two ways. We either have a thing called a triac or we have a MOSFET. And both of them essentially look like each other. It's just that they do this in different ways. With a triac, you're kind of talking a little bit like cheaper. So most standard dimmers that don't have a neutral uh, input onto them, the cheaper dimmers, they're gonna be triac based. So a lot of the incandescent dimmers, halogens, magnetic low voltage, there's no neutral, they're generally cheaper and they're generally designed cheaper as well. Once you get into the higher end dimmers, you're talking electronic. So you're like magnetic, old school, electronic, new school. <laughs> so electronic low voltage, LED, CFLs, um, you're gonna be probably dealing with a MOSFET and it, which means it's gonna require that you have a neutral because the way that a MOSFET and a triac work is very different. A triac will work on essentially like latching. You're, sent, you're bumping a signal to it, but you don't have to like unbump the signal. 
with a MOSFET, you have to constantly have a control logic voltage. So you have to constantly have like an active power going to it, which requires a completed circuit, which is why you need a neutral going to the device. They're a little bit higher end, but they're nicer and they typically work a lot better. So uh, the triac, when you're dealing triac, you're dealing forward phase. And remember I said forward phase means that we are removing the forward edge. We're delaying the forward part of the phase. So with a triac, you're typically talking about a huge inrush all of a sudden. Um, both of them kind of look the same. There's like three pins that go into a device, but how they operate fundamentally is different. So triacs are gonna be your forward phase device. MOSFETs are gonna be your reverse phase. So anything with a neutral typically for a dimmer is gonna be a reverse phase dimmer. Anything that doesn't have it is going to be a forward phase. So do a little bit of research with the light bulbs that you're putting into these things to figure out if it matches. And this is why matching bulbs to dimmers and testing, you know, like Lutron has their whole list of these are all of the approved bulbs that we've tested with our technology. And partially it has to do with this very thing and the compatibility of them. So with Triax, you're going to have a very high inrush reset, right? Immediately high inrush with MOSFETs. There's not going to be an inrush. Um, with MOSFETs, you have this drop in voltage that happens, but with uh, Triax, you don't. So with Triax, typically they're going to work with AC. MOSFETs are, are only going to work in DC, which is why a lot of your electronic low voltage, your LEDs have drivers DC. Um, so that kind of makes sense. With Triax, we're current driven. So it's really the changes in current because we are dealing with an inductor. And uh, we have changes of voltage that drive a MOSFET because we're talking about a capacitor. Um, not, not an inductor or capacitor, but we're talking about an inductive component or a capacitive component. These are self-sustaining, which I talked about self-latching. You just have to trigger them for them to change states, for them to allow current to flow. Where these have to have active control at all times, we have to have a voltage present for the control logic to be able to change the device. That's why we need a neutral in all of them. So problems that you can end up with incandescent, it's gonna work fine on forward or reverse phase. So that's why triax still work. It doesn't really matter either way because it's just a resistor. So you're just changing current through a resistor. It doesn't matter if there's uh, you know, a leading edge or a, or a trailing edge. Uh, mag magnetic low voltage, you're probably gonna see if you put the wrong um, phase cutting, flickering, buzzing, or there's gonna be like a short dimming range. Actually with both of these, uh, with magnetic or electronic low voltage, if you don't get this right, you're gonna have these abrupt switches that happen, changes in state. And built up fast enough over you know a long period of time, it develops a hum or a flicker because it's not meant to handle the switching that's happening. So, uh, and again, both of them, you're probably not gonna have a very good dimming range. You might see like little subtle uh, dimming, but it's gonna be a shortened range of dimming. Um, LED with forward phase, if you have it, uh, if you actually change a forward phase LED to reverse phase, it actually does better. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. And a lot of the big custom homes that we've had to do where we have Lutron lighting systems, if you go through and change it to reverse phase, if it's a forward phase light, it actually acts right and it stops the flutter. Not every time with all bulbs, but it does help a lot of the time. Um, if you have a reverse phase LED and you try to make it forward phase, um, you're probably gonna see some flickers, buzzing, reduced dimming ranges again. So the forward phase seems to handle the reverse phase better than the reverse handles the forward. And then if you have a dimmable CFL specifically, not a just regular CFL, you can't dim a regular CFL, it has to be a dimmable CFL. Um, but it's either just not gonna work or it's gonna cut out early. So if you're changing the phase cutting on them, um, a lot of times with CFLs, they act really wacky when you try to do that. So that's dimming in a nutshell. You're either gonna be like the old school magnetic with a rheostat changing your level of resistance, or you're gonna have some kind of electronic means that is either using an inductive sort of setup or a capacitive sort of setup. And they either are trying to resist the current or resist the voltage just inherently in the design. And so to achieve these dimming and these phase cuttings, we either use a MOSFET or we use a triac to do it. But that is dimming. Let me know if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns. Love you crazy people. I'll see you in the next one.